I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. There's no better star than me in this country, without a doubt. A superstar. I want to be the best. And I don't see a single reason why I shouldn't be. Ah, Spanion. Bro, what did I start? From prison cell to rising social media juggernaut. People are attracted to his brutal honesty, lifestyle, and of course, years as a career criminal. But I'm not going to tell you ever don't be a criminal because I'm not a policeman and I'm not your dad and I don't really care what you do. I was a crook before, I got out, talked on social media, next thing, look, I don't know. He's setting a new path because life right now is a lot easier than solitary confinement. So you know how everyone says, what's your dream job? Oh, I want to be the bloke on getaway that flies around the world. Oh, I want to be the bloke that just sits back and runs multiple businesses. Imagine your job was just being yourself. They come, they gas everyone. Everyone gets screamed at, guns get shot into the floor. If they want to kill you, they can kill you. You'll die in 30 seconds. I'm going to be a personality and I'll say whatever I want, hate it or love it. Spanion, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Oh, wait, Mala. You're looking good, man. You look really fit. Like, what's going on? I'm, I'm all rugged up here or freezing cold. You've got a T-shirt and shorts on. Oh, well, uh, I, I, that, I, everyone says that. I think, you know what, straight out, because I spent so much time in a Lowe's tracksuit in Bathurst Yard yeah, yeah. Um, in freezing cold winters that Sydney weather's nothing. Yeah. I have not experienced a cold Sydney day. Like everyone out there, as soon as the as soon as the as soon as it hits winter, they're in these big jackets. I'm just like footy shorts, walking around, singlets. Like, you know, I, I adapted to lift go on Bathurst. <laughs> yeah, it gets pretty cold out there. Yeah, yeah. Real cold. Hey, we're talking about that. Let's go, let's go back a little bit. Uh so I mean, I guess your your life is has been fairly up and down, especially as a young bloke. Um What's your first experience of running with the coppers? Oh, first experience running with the coppers. Can you remember it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it's either one of the two. They were very close to each other when I was in about year four, year five in primary school. So it's either it's either when I stabbed a kid in the schoolyard or I had allegedly burned down this big sugar mill in Holston Park and got questioned about it. Um that was so. I, was like, I don't know which one was first. It was just, the kid you stab was like a, a full on stab, or was it just a you know like a a quick stab? You know what I mean? Like no, no, it wasn't a stabbing through the heart or something. No, no, it wasn't yeah. a frenzied stabbing. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. just me like learning how to just use around. knives and going at him, and he went to block it and went through his hand and yeah. yeah. So 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 what's interesting about that? What, what school were you doing? Like, Canterbury Primary. Uh, Canterbury Primary. Okay, yeah. so I went to school at Lakemba. Okay, yep. so when we were at school. It wasn't unusual to have a knife at school. When I was a kid growing up, everyone had knives. You weren't allowed to take flick knife, but you took yeah. lock knives and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And we played games like uh, a game of stretch where uh, you would stand up with me, stand up with me, put our feet apart, and I used to throw the knife over there to the right. You'd had to step into that spot and then you'd throw the knife onto the other side and I'd have to say, would you stretch me out? And the only way I could bring my legs back to normal is I had to throw the knife between your feet and uh, actually get between your feet. And often the knife would go astray yep. and get end up in blokes' ankles and legs and stuff like that. And when people get shocked when they hear these stories about you, you, know, you stabbed a kid, um, it's sort of not that bad, was it? Like, I, that, I don't look at it as that bad. I, it's not yeah, that good, but it's no, not it's that it's not good and people carry on because, like, uh, when I tell the story, I have, like, little chuckles about it. But I don't know. They just don't understand. They're, everyone's hypersensitive. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not that bad, though. I mean, nah, nah, you, know, you know, like sort of thing, I can't carry this massive guilt. No thing. way. I didn't, it wasn't something that was atrocious and yeah, changed yeah, someone's yeah. life. You know what I mean? There's, there's People ask that about a lot of my crimes in general and the way that I see that is that, well, the mentality that I have that was give, that I was raised with in jail is there is putrid acts um, and then it's not all crime are putrid acts. But a lot of putrid acts are the things that you would presume to be putrid acts. It's doing things to a child, doing things to like a, a grandma or an 80-year-old, um, a rapist. They're, they're the things you see as putrid yeah, acts. full-on you know? victims. Yeah, they're putrid acts. Yeah. Like there's no way around that. It's it's a universal understanding that these are putrid acts, whether you're from Sydney or from Nairobi, like they're putrid acts. And I've never done one of those putrid acts. I've done a lot of crimes. So I just have a chuckle about a lot of them, including that. Well, yeah, but, and it, it's funny. It's interesting you should say it because, you know, like a, you know, fortunate, unfortunate, have, whatever I look at it, I'm going to grow up with mates like that. And, uh, you know, where I grew up, that's pretty normal. And uh, people did things and regrettably they got into trouble for it, but they, they don't really weren't bad people to me. Um, and 
generally speaking, they always treated me and my family really well. And you mentioned about what is universally considered to be a putrid act. Mm. And in jail, there's a view about an accepted view. Yeah. What is a putrid act? Yeah. And uh, and it's and and those people, everybody knows who they are when they turn up mm. in, into the jail. And it's like uh, jail has the really basic fundamental laws about what you how you conduct your life yeah. and how you behave. What did you learn from that that experience? Because you've been to, to jail and you, you know you've lived that life. Yeah. What did you learn from that about? And what have you taken out of jail from that? Oh, um, I, w- I would say that. The things that most immediately come to mind is is what is and what isn't a dog and the way to live your life, like, in, in terms of that. Um, and that is, in my opinion, in jail opinion, is that if somebody who chooses to benefit from a criminal lifestyle, then to avoid the consequences by dobbing on someone else. That's a dog. Um, a lot of people get that wrong. A lot of people think that if you're a normal person and you call the coppers on someone, you're a dog, but it doesn't work like that. So you know what I mean? It's not as black and white as that. Um, so that's one thing that I always hold, hold to me. And you another, live by that now? Yeah, of course, of yep. course. If if I'm a criminal, if I benefit it in any way or glamorize it or even use that image, which I, I'm not a criminal anymore, but I still have the stories and the image of a criminal, so then I should still live by that. Unless I fully just give it up and become a Christian and work at Woolworths and be like, no, that was naughty and I feel bad for everything that I, then I would feel free to dob on people, but I'm not at that stage yet. Um, so that's one thing. And another thing, the biggest lesson I ever learned in jail is, is um, to never do something for someone that wouldn't do the same for you. And that's the biggest lesson I ever learned. And it was the very first time I went in jail and like, Coincidentally, it's the very first night or the very first time I went in jail. It happened to be the biggest lesson by someone I didn't know. And it was an older Koori fella from Campbelltown. I don't remember his name. It wasn't a full jail bird, but been in a couple of times. And he turned to me and he said, he said that lesson, don't do something for someone that wouldn't do the same for you. And I just go, yeah, yeah sweet, sweet. And he goes, what does that mean? Like, what am I telling you? Do you understand? And I said to him, I go, don't do stuff for people. And he said, no, that's not what I'm saying to you. Said, think of it this way. If you have some bloke there and he tells you, bro, do you reckon you can chuck that in the bin for me? That's okay to chuck something in the bin for someone. But ask yourself, if you ask him the same question, would he turn around and say, fuck off, idiot, who do you think I am? Then don't do it for him, no matter what his consequences are to you. And as simple as that. But if you believe that person will do it for you, then do it for them. Do anything they ask you if you believe they would give you the same. And I just thought that that's so... That's such a great um, concept that applies to just life in general and it stops you from being someone that won't do anything for anyone and it stops you being a pushover at the same time. Why do you think this Guri fella told you that? Why did he tell me? I really don't know, eh? I really don't know. Didn't know him from a bar of soap. Did you, did you meet up with him? Did you become friend, friendly with him? Not at all. Probably spent like two nights. So when you go into jail, like you're on a truck with a bunch of people you'll never see again. You get put into a transit wing, which is randomly. You don't get to select your cellmate. You're probably not even there for a week. Your cellmates will come and go every night. They're all just off the street and you're waiting to be shipped out and it just so happened to be who I put in with. Maybe spent a night or two with him, never seen him again. You mentioned Corey's like uh, the jails are pretty, unfortunately, that well, it's just a fact, I guess. They're packed There's with Corey's. Lots of yeah. Indigenous, like yeah. massive, right? Yeah. And uh, People yeah. always... Um, Tiptoe around the ways to say they're packed with yeah, Corey. Totally. Everyone knows that. Yeah, yeah. Totally. And, and they and they they stick together. Yeah. And, and they're very they're very loyal to each other mm-hmm. and look after each other. Yep. Big time. And you know you don't get on the wrong side of me either. By the way. Mm. So, but and you have you have an affiliation like or a, a sensitivity towards the indigenous yep. um, culture in in Australia or particularly here in Sydney. Yep. Um, do you feel as though you uh, resonate with them, or they resonate with you? I mean, Look, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go as deep to say there is something culturally and spiritually about them that resonates with something within me. I'm not going to say that. It's just exposure. It's just. It's just exposure. So um, I moved as a young age, the age where I grew up in Dulwich Hill, Maryville area, when I was at the age where you weren't allowed to leave the house. So that area didn't shape me. As soon as I was old enough to leave the house and become my own man, I lived around the Glebe area. Woolamaloo, Wardley, Redfern. Um, so everybody that I was friends with, nearly everybody bar two people were Aboriginal. 
um, like my partners at the time were Aboriginal. I was in Aboriginal gangs and, they, yeah, I, like my firstborn son is Aboriginal. And like so I went to jail and it's like all my mates from the outside, when you go to jail, obviously, you know what I mean, to tell you what Nasho you are, you go with them. So here we are, me and all my mates who are all Aboriginal going to jail and then they're all sitting over there with the Koorys. I said, what do I sit by myself? They're my mates. So I creep over and I'm sitting with the Koorys and some of the ones that aren't from Redfern area, most of the Koorys aren't. They're from the country areas, you know, Dubbo and all those areas. And they're like, who's this? Why is this wog kid sitting with us? Then the older boys from the city areas would turn to them and say, no, he's one of the boys. He's from Redfern. He grew up with us. And I'm like, oh, doing buzz. And so a couple of years of that and you just accept it and obviously – who you, who you hang around, you start to talk like them and start to act like them and that's it. That's how I grew up. I spent 20 years of my life with them. Do you think you've – or any of their cultural things have rubbed off on you? Like have you adopted any of their cultural views or – Look, with- I wouldn't say in the broader spectrum of Aboriginality in Australia that I've adopted their, their ways. I'm definitely nothing like an Aboriginal person from the Northern Territory but I'm very much like an Aboriginal lad from – Sydney here, where we are, down the street, Woolloomooloo. Um, and they're just one of the boys. There's no difference. Here we're all the same. Doesn't matter if you're Tongan, doesn't matter if you're Lebo, doesn't matter if you're Kuri, or half Spanish and French and Dutch and whatever I am, <laughs> and a bit of this, bit of that. So we're all the same. Um, yeah. But, yeah, you're right. A lot of our ways here in the city uh, are like everyone thinks that we act like Kuris. Like there's like f- – Say, for example, our Islander mates here, they go to jail, the boys from like Glebe and like Woolow and that, they go to jail and the other Islanders look at them and they're like, they're full-blown Tongans and full-blown Maoris and the other Islander boys in jail look at them like, what do you talk like Aboriginal, bro? <laughs> and they're like, bro, I don't know, bro, I'm from Redfern, you know what I mean? Like, And so like, yeah, that's that's the way we are, yeah. You're so open about your incarcerations. Um, what are your, you, obviously you've got mum and dad, What are, what is your background? And what do they think about what you've, how you've led your life in your early years? My background. So four, par- four grandparents, four different nationalities, all born in their places. Oh, really? Uh, so one's uh, my granddad, Irish. My, gran- my grandmother born in Lille in France. My other grandmother born in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And my other grandfather born in Spain. Irish, Spanish, French, Dutch. We're European, West Europe. and but they're all totally different cultures. Totally different, yeah, yeah. So, like, I'm legitimately, yeah, meet each one of my grandparents and they full are that culture. You know what I mean? Like, they, yeah. Um, and I don't know, like, it wasn't a big thing to my family because my family, I'm, I'm not saying that I come from some, like, crazy gangster family. You know what I mean? Not like that. But they were crooks and they were, like, scallywag people. You know what I mean? It was not when they were kids, they were stealing cars and there's drug addicts in my family and this and that. So it's nothing for me to start crime and do crime. Yeah. So they didn't bother them, so to speak, you know. And not not too much. Like to be honest, like the only time my mum ever had a cry was when she'd come into the cop shop and she, I felt like she was faking it for the cops. <laughs> yeah. It's like otherwise, like I'll park hotties in the street, stolen cars, like when I was like 14. She wouldn't say nothing. Like, you know what I mean? Come home with bundles, this and that. And then, like, but if I get arrested, she's at the cop shop crying, like, what's happening to you? Why are you like this? I'm looking at her like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? I was in this car last night at home. I parked it in your parking spot. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, but she puts the show on. And the grandparents, are they living here? Or, yeah. Uh, or look, were they living here? Uh, a couple of them are dead, but my grandma lives out Western Sydney and my grandfather lives around the Lichu area. Yeah. Um, I've never heard an opinion from them. Yeah, and uh, do any of them influence any one of them influence you more than the other? Not at all. Do you like you were close to anyone? Like really close. Uh, to? The closest I am is to my mum's mum. Well, yeah. what, what Nasho? Uh, she, she's she's the French one. French one. Yeah, right. um, it's my mum's mum. I'm the closest to. Yeah. And then in ter- you got brothers and sisters. Yeah, I got one. Uh, oh well, I have a, a sister and a brother that on my dad's side. Um, Step brother and a half brother. Yeah, half half brother, half sister. Yeah. On my dad's side, and um, they live in Queensland, and I'm not. Like I've spent maybe two months of my life with them. Um, but I have a brother here that I'm very close to, yeah. On your mum's side? Yeah, my mum's side. He's, he's my younger brother. Do you feel a, a sense of, um, uh, I don't know, uh, responsibility towards him? Not really. No? No. 
Okay. He, he just runs his own race, and you don't. He does his own thing. You he's, know, he's, mate, come here. No, no, nah, nah, not at all. Um, he's he's completely the opposite of me. Is he? Yeah, he's like a nerdy kid. Loves games. Works every day. He's, yeah, he's complete opposite to me. And it, when you say he works every day, you're saying you don't work every day, or you do, uh, these days. <laughs> well, nowadays I've come to call what I do now this this whole um famous gig as work. I accept that. Yeah. Um, because I'm out here every day working and I feel like like I told you before this, like next month I'm flying halfway around the world working and stuff like that. And but other than that, I've never worked a day in my life. Do you ever think to yourself, how the fuck did this happen? Like Oh bro. You don't understand. Last night. Last night some I got my I say it like once a week, my missus is sick of hearing it. I got my missus in the lounge and I looked at her and I'm like, what's going on? Like, bro, like I, it's hard for me to understand, like, I heard of that thing, imposter syndrome. I'm like, I just don't know. Like, I spin out. I don't know how it got to where it's at. Like, they're, we're here talking about, like, I won't say too much because nothing's locked in, but we're here talking about movies and Netflix and I'm flying around the world for YouTube and every video is trending on the so and there's money coming flying in. It's just crazy. It's all these people working for me. I don't understand that, bro, like, I was a crook before I got out, talked on social media. Next thing, look, I don't know. <laughs> I saw you were a cook. Crook, crook. A crook. I thought you were a cook. I was going to say, did you, when you were in the Nick, did they teach you how to cook or something? Uh, tuna and noodles, yeah. <laughs> tuna and noodles. So, but what, wait, how, many, how many years of your early life do you reckon you've spent locked up? I spent 13 years. 13 locked years up, yeah. locked up. I know. I've counted it to the month many yeah, times. Yeah. It's a bit less. 12, 12 years, eight months. I'll just say 13. Okay. So you come out of, you come out of all that. Yep. And then I want to know how you got to where you got to now, where you are, how, how you arrived in this current spot. Like, so you, you come out, yeah. you, you're not a, you're not a, you don't have a trade. You no. didn't get a trade when no. you when you're locked up. You didn't do any study when you're locked up. No courses, you did, no work inside. No, nah, and you came out. security the whole time. Uh, yeah, totally. And, yeah. and then you come out and you think, fuck, what am I going to do? I didn't know what to do. And um, I had this bloke that I met, how it all started, this this social fame, whatever it is. Still don't know how to word it. I still don't know how to word it. But um, how it all started. Success. This, school success. success. Yeah, there you go. I love that. All this success, That's I'm, I'm running with that now. That's it's it. yours. You just gave it to Dude, me. Dude, it's yours. Take so it. all of this great success um, come because this one bloke I met in jail, I used to write raps in jail, been rapping since 2002. Never thought much of it. Thought Aussie rap was a joke. Um, and he was just adamant that I rap and I had some mad skill and he continued his persistence with me after I got out. He'd message me. He's like, please. He taught me what social media was. I knew what Facebook was, didn't use it, and but he taught me about Instagram and Instagram is the central power to building any type of subculture and being part of it and blah, blah, blah. So he started me on Instagram and I put some songs out and it slowly grew, slowly grew. Uh, a year deep, I had maybe seven, 8,000 followers. Uh, Couple thousand views on my YouTube channel, but this rap, this this, this is Aussie rap, yep, yeah. Yep. That's all I done, yeah. Um, Performing it or writing it? What do you do? Uh, writing and and then making the film clip, yeah, and then releasing it on the internet right. and and the associated promotions on Instagram, yep. yeah. Go to my YouTube, yep. normal stuff. Then um, I spoke for the first time. Like I didn't think, especially coming from like jail, is like you got the mentality uh, to not talk yourself up, which which is like. It, it can it, it can be a very bad thing, you know. It's it's very noble to say it. Don't talk yourself up. Just do stuff. Don't sing this and that. But in this world, in this competitive world and how it's like marketed these days, it's, it's almost as powerful to talk yourself up as it is to do stuff. And one without the other is sometimes pointless. And I didn't understand that. And so I talked. I wouldn't say I talked myself up, but someone wanted to come to me and do an interview because they thought, I was a real interesting character. I didn't see myself as an interesting character because I seen my life as just the norm, but apparently it's not. And so he interviewed me as a one-hour interview. Can you remember who it was? Uh, who was it? Or his, what was it? What was the It was medium? just um, – so the interview was this kid. Uh, he's, I can't remember his name. I think it was Clayton. And he had his own YouTube channel that he wanted to grow. And what he wanted to do was like interview interesting Aussie rappers that are on the come up yep. and hear their backstory. So I told him my story, how I grew up, and um, there was a little – while I was filming, there was a little commotion, slapped someone in the face, this and that. And anyway, the video just went off and it just started from there. 
and the power I had in speaking on camera, telling any story or addressing any subject was just so much bigger than music. And it was so easy. I find it so easy to talk. Or natu- um, maybe just natural. May- maybe, maybe, yeah. And and it just went off. So then I decided from that point to always, to not just be this quiet gangster rapper say, that doesn't say anything. And I was like, no, no, no. I'm going to be a personality. I'll make my raps and I'll say whatever I want, hate it or love it. That was the the, the forming moment. And the content of your rap, so is it is it actual like gangster rap where you're sort of glorifying that life of crime or is it something else? Um, without getting into the like, finer details of it, 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 you would view it as gangster rap where I'm glorifying crime. A rap about nothing other than crime and murders and stuff like that. Um, so I guess, yeah, a, normal, a person will see it as, I, I see it as more a horrorcore rap um, where it's not really gangster rap. I've never been a gangster, never been in a gang and I don't know that life. It's more just vicious, brutal rap. I'll smash your head in, I'll stab you, you're a gronk, I'm the best in the world, I'm so good. You're, you're just normal rap behaviour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm but, definitely not no feel-good rapper. It's not a feel-good. It's no, not, it's not, not a like rap. Christianized no, or no, sort There's of no stuff. positivity uh, in my rap at yeah. all. But, but it but it's nonetheless resonates with your audience. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it is your personality side of the thing, business and your success, greater or bigger, much bigger than, say, the content, the rap piece? Oh, the rap piece wouldn't even be 3%. Yeah. Yeah. Way, way, way bigger. So what did you think when you thought to yourself, hang on a minute, like uh, you discovered this thing that people are more interested in my story and maybe who I am and all that type of stuff than they are in my um, my content, my rap. Mm. Well, did I you... spun out at first. Yeah. It was a little bit annoying at first because I'd been set – uh, by my mate is like rap raps everything. So I was like, you know what I mean? Like, watch my rap songs, you idiots. Sydney listen to me talk. Yeah. You love me so much. Go give me views on my on my songs. But then I loved it because like I just couldn't be me and just have great success because of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just from just, being me, like it's yeah, just the best. So that's that's the thing that's a, a freak out. Like uh, yeah. you're sitting there thinking, I'm just doing what I, I'm just talking about like, myself. You know how everyone, like, think of this. You know how everyone says, what's your dream job? Oh, I want to be the bloke on getaway that flies around the world. Oh, I want to be the bloke that just sits back and runs multiple businesses. Imagine your job was just being yourself. Like imagine that. Like that's my job, just be myself. And what do you want to see me do now? You want to see me do car reviews? I've done a season of them. They're coming out soon. Just thrashing around Lamborghinis and McLarens around racetracks. Like just being myself. And the whole thing of the show is just my reactions and how great I am doing it. But I'm just being myself. Like this is the 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 mannerisms and, and, and the ways I've got from the streets where I grew up mixed with a bit of like, you know, my own spin on it, you know. So is, it, so is there no performance? So in other words. No, not at all. I'm 100% myself yeah, it's, every single thing. It's, it's no stage, not called fake, but there's, yeah. there's no performance in it. Like you're not. Not at all. You're sort of lifting it to make it a little bit more interesting or putting a bit of. Not something. at all. It, there is not a single thing that I go in with. Most of the things I go in with no knowledge. Like uh, even for this podcast that you sent to my managers, like a, a general list of things, I think you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't look them. at them. There's nothing that you can tell me that I is going to like I need to have a think about before I answer. There's nothing. So like I don't even – even my own podcast when I run them, they, I have people that like, you know, like you'd have the, the intro and all the questions and points. It's like, wow. If it's something really difficult, like don't get me wrong, so coming up I've got like a China expert and stuff like that, it's it's very acquired knowledge. Yeah. I'll think like, all right, I need to ask this stuff. But other than that, like something like this, it's – it's just ourselves. Well, don't get me wrong, but uh, our producer who's sitting over there on our right, yep. she does the same things, but I never fucking read her yeah. stuff. Her. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, especially for today, um, yeah. I just – anything I looked up the thing – the uh, I looked up on the brief today was uh, see if I need to know your first name. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. So that, I was good with that. I'm sort of living the same life, to be honest. When I think of when you said it – when you said it, it made me think about my life. Yeah. I'm doing what I love doing, like just talking to dudes. Yeah, hectic. Yeah, like interesting people to me. Yeah. Like just interesting people and uh, – and, and making money out of it, which is That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> pretty, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty happy. Yeah. But, it, but but I'm much older. And it took me sixty odd years to work that shit out. Yeah. <laughs> but but a lot of it's a lot of it's the power of the internet and Facebook and Instagram and that sort of stuff, YouTube. Mm. But probably what's more important is um, storytelling mm-hmm. and actually having stories to tell. Yeah. And 
authenticity, honesty. And what you probably are doing, why you are successful, is that you, you know, give a shit. You, you, you're not trying to hide anything. You're telling good stories. You've got stories to tell about jail. You told a story about the first dude you met and how he yeah. told you about rap. Um, but you tell in an authentic, uh, an honest way and then authenticity. Then you've got the platforms to sh- yeah. tell everybody, which means this guy is authentic. Yeah, yeah. And then add to that a little bit of you're an unusual looking character, yep. you know, like you you got your tats, you know, yep, you yep. got your your look. You yep. look a certain way, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that's sort of I mean, no, I'm not taking nothing away, but this is part of the performance, to yep, be honest yep. with you. Like you you're not dressing up in a suit trying to be something different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And part of the performance is try not to be something different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Try to be yeah. yourself. Oh yeah. 100%. So you make your money out of what is actually the right way to use yeah. Instagram and all those sorts of things today. I mean, that's to me, that's you don't have to know about how the thing gets fucking produced. Or yeah, yeah, that's right. It's all shit. Like, uh, and do people come to you and say, "Hey, Spaniard, like, uh, we got these cars. We want you to review." Like, how, how does that work? Well, what did they get uh, you? Uh, we will sit in meetings and talk about what direction we want to take with our own content, leading towards potential bigger things in my career. So, what content can we produce that is? Uh, proof in itself for things I'm trying to achieve, so things that are within our power. So we sit there with many ideas and uh, doing car reviews is just something I thought that's so cool and I'd love to do it and it'll actually help me. You know, it's a good branding exercise and stuff like that. And um, so we decide, people don't just randomly come to me and say, hey, do you want to fly on my airplane? No, like we decide what we want to do and then my team will put their tentacles out there and the people out there that understand which would be surprised a lot of like businesses still don't understand the the power of YouTube and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like when it comes to promotions, they're getting there. We're we're a lot behind other countries, but a lot of them do. So as soon as they hear there's somebody who is big on YouTube or big on here that wants to have anything to do with it, they're like, bro, here, please drive everything of mine, fly, eat everything of mine and wear everything of mine. Just make showing the background, my name's there somewhere. And it's like, yeah, and then that's how. So the tentacles would have to be put out first. Do you know much about your audience? I mean, so who do you think your audience is? Oh, well, it's uh, – They men, fem- men uh, the, women? It's it's on average – every platform is different. I would say it's 80 to 82% on average male, of yep. course. Um, the, the, the highest um, age group is actually in their 30s. So I think it was from 25 to 35. The second highest is 35 to – 40, and everyone thinks that it's like 16 year olds and that and it's um it's not it's yeah it's 20 to 40 year olds obviously largely male because i don't really play on the sexy guy stuff um i just i feel like i don't need to i've already got too much going on nothing against people that do it's a very powerful tool so that's why my female things like always 18 percent because i don't try to be the sexy guy although if i did i could certainly do that but um <laughs> yeah but um <laughs> so yeah that that's that's my general demographic yeah, yeah. so isn't it interesting uh, who would have thought a bloke is pretty much probably didn't go to school that much didn't go to university but um spent time locked up now is talking about analytics yeah. and uh <laughs> and uh, content and uh how how to build content and how to then you know obviously find uh advertisers etc yeah. like you never thought you'd be in that position. No, no, no. And you're, but you're running a business, yeah. Or, or, and with various subparts to the business. Mm. So I want to talk to you about your food thing. Yeah. So t- tell us about that. What's what's the uh, deal? My with it? it's all eight series. Um, what's it called? It's all eight. It's all eight. Yeah, it's a wordplay because um, from the streets we say eats. Eats means like sweet, like eats. Well, it's a play of pig Latin yeah, yeah, eats. Yeah, yeah. So a common saying for us is it's all eats. Like it means it's all sweet. Like everything's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and but we change the eats to the a, um, so it's food. Yeah. So yeah. my series is called It's All Eats, and it pops off like it's. I, I, I won't make the claim. I will make the claim. It's probably wrong, but it's the biggest, definitely the biggest food series in Australia. Like we put out an episode a week. It's on YouTube. On YouTube, yep. yeah, on my channel. It trends every episode. Trends like number four in Australia, number eight in Australia. Um, what are you doing it? And so I go around, only Sydney at the moment we've done, and I go everywhere from nice classy restaurants to um, markets like Chinatown markets, the Ramadan markets, to cultural eating spots out in Liverpool and Penrith and this. And, and I go and I um, review their food and do you, I do you, comical reactions and all the great stuff. Do you stuff. ring them up and say, Look, I'm, I'm coming in or just they turn do. up? No, no, no they, they do. Your team does. Oh, yeah. Um, if, if it's like – 
if it's what I call on the fly style, so markets and street food, obviously no one has to be told. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but if, if it's an establishment, of course, it's properly organized and uh, we meet the chef, they tell us their story, we go in the cooking areas, they and thing, and they bring us out the whole. It's yeah, it's probably done. I don't just sit in the corner with a secret camera. <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, it's properly done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, then you review, do you actually say, like, you, I don't know, did you go to Ramadan in um, um, Lakemba? Lakemba? Yeah. I did that one too. Yeah, I went to, yeah, yeah. Did you get the uh, camel burger? I did. Yeah, and, how I, cool. and the D burger. And I um, compared them. I like the D burger better. I like the camel burger. Did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it was good. Um, yeah, yeah. I like the, was the sauce on the camel burger, mate? I mean, just, yeah, I yeah. didn't really taste the camel meat. I couldn't taste. It just tastes like beef to me. But like, Bro, but it's the sauce. What? Please, I can't believe you said that. Please watch that episode. That's what I say about them. I'm eating the camel burger. You expect this camel tasting yeah, thing? Yeah. And I ate it, and I go look. I was out of earshot from the bloke and I go, just tastes like a Big Mac, bro. Like, just tastes like a beef burger. Well, I like, know, but it was sort of like a spicy sauce. It was pretty good. Yeah, I the had, sauce was good, but... When you do this stuff, um, do you get sort of mobbed by people? They're around there sort of patting you on the back and saying, hey, go on, get a photo, selfie. How do you go with all that shit? Yeah, I, bro, I get like, I'm at about 50 photos a day. Nowadays, in, in in normal environment, just walking around, just walking around every street, ev- everywhere, out of cars, out of construction, everyone knows me from like business people to school kids. It's 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 crazy, but yeah, um, any of my episodes where I've been filming, I just have people. That, that's good. I love it. Um, but they come up while I'm filming and get photos of me, and they spin out. I'm like, oh my god, it's you! Like all that stuff. Yeah, it's pretty unusual. Blokes have been in jail. They normally don't like that lifestyle. Yeah, they, they don't like to open up to people and, mm. you know, get a fucking away from me. Uh, I mean, I, you know, yeah. I know a couple of blokes and, you know, that's sort of how it is. I mean, how hard is it? Were you always that way or did you have to become this person who's opened? To, so, yeah, I'll, I'll cop a sweet. I'm happy to get a photograph with you. No, no, I was always a friendly person like that. Um, I don't think it really translates into uh, personal relationships. I wouldn't say I'm so social and friends with everyone, but in just like the common people in Friendly exchanges, I'm very easy. So it's yeah. just a transaction for you. Like you're out in the street, someone's going to get yeah, a photo. Yeah, yeah. yeah cool. Yeah, yeah, it's nothing to me. But are you, but and then if, but uh, on the flip side of you, are you really social though? Like no, no. So you're not sort of guys always going, you're going out, hanging out. Never. So Never. everything you do is just for work. Let's call it work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. If 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 there's an objective to the things I do, and it's directly related to what I do, though, I'm sweet doing anything. Sweet having our conversations yeah, with yeah. cameras on me, this and that. I wouldn't do this off camera. I wouldn't sit with somebody talking endlessly. I'd rather just sit by myself or walk around. I was going to say, gym. so what are you like um, outside of outside of the, the I'm, sort of work transaction? Yeah. Like outside? I just exist with my, uh, my missus just all the time. I'm at home and I train every day and um, I like going around having a coffee, mostly by myself. We eat out every day, me and my missus and – that's my life. I'm a very home person. Yeah. Yeah. To me, you come across as pretty shy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's more like, look, I'm not, you know, this is going to sound like I'm bridging up in some sort of way, but it is what it is. Like, I, I guess that you'd come across a lot of people um, and, and like, to come here with someone with cameras who runs a podcast and this and that's like a big thing. Yeah, so yeah. they're coming up with all show. It's like, bro, how are you? I'm so happy to be here. And yeah, hey, hey, oh, is that your producer? Hey, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's just so normal now. It's just like, hey, how are you, brother? Yep, sweet. Yeah. Yeah, you're going in, yeah. yeah. Like I'm polite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's just, it's more that than shy. I'm definitely not shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a bit similar to myself. But when you're in it, yeah. you're good. Yeah, yeah. And I think we're both too clever to let that um, translate into our Shows either, you know what Why I mean? Why do you yeah. think? Because I know other people are the opposite. <laughs> They're fucking mm. totally social and really good at this shit. Um, and uh, is it because blokes like you, maybe me too, we sort of um, sort of fumble into these environments? We didn't actually belong in these environments originally, but we've been pretty successful and we've got something good to talk about and they're therefore um, – we um, just continue doing the same thing or, or, or because, I mean, you never dreamt. Yeah. This wasn't your big dream thing where you're sort of when you're a kid, you're laying in bed dreaming, oh, I'm going to be this dude nah. one day and, you know, the shitloads of people around the country are going to be yeah. following me and listening to what I've got to say about cars, food, yeah. my story, etc. I mean. <laughs> I just, I, I, re- I really can't speak for anyone else, but for, just for me it's, it's just because it's, it's just easy. Like if I can get handed this opportunity and somehow find it too hard, like what am I good for? 
like what type of hard work and you know what I mean? Like, yeah, all right, I do a lot of this. I do a lot of filming. I do a lot of podcasts and I have to go to meetings. whoop de do. It's not that fucking it's people hard. people out there digging nonstop. Think, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah, nothing. Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and put me on. You hear those people like, I don't know, it's, look, there's truth to it and there's not truth to it. Those people, they're really successful, Arnold Schwarzenegger's this and that, and they just like, and they just go on like they're the hardest workers on earth and that's why they are. Mate, there's harder workers than you in India. Thank and you. they ain't in the Predator or Terminator. Like, it yeah. don't just come down to that. It comes down to a lot of luck, a lot of timing, and hard work, you know. But I'm not going to say, yeah, that's, that's there. Do you, do, do you still uh, talk to the bloke who told you about to do the rap, the bloke you met? I do, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I yeah. do, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and he spins out. Does he? He's, of course, he's spinning out. He was like, bro, what did I start? He's like, you know, he birthed me in his eyes, do you know what I mean? He's like, bro, I just told you to put out a couple of rap songs. Next minute you're the biggest celebrity in the country. Like, what's going on? <laughs> Next minute you'll see me in Netflix movies. You'll be like, well, how did this happen? <laughs> you'll be a bit resentful. And, uh, do, you think you, do you think you'll do a Netflix movie? Do, 100%. Because no, they're looking uh, for uh, content all the time, especially am, this yeah. sort of content. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's no better. There's no better star than me in this country, without a doubt. I know, I see what's going on and, and I say that with all truth. Like, that is my goals, to be a superstar. My goals isn't to do a food show. My goals isn't to be an Aussie rapper. My goals is to be the, a, a, a superstar. I want to be the best and I don't see a single reason why I shouldn't be. Yeah, Whether it happens or not comes down to a lot of other factors that are out of my control, but I'll do what I can to achieve it. As long as I'm aiming for that, wherever I fall short will be a bloody good place. Do, do, you, do you make sure then that you surround yourselves with yourself, with mm -hmm. um, um, good, smart people who are really good at stuff that you're not good at or not educated in? De definitely. My team is um, – my team makes everything happen. Like, yeah, I'm good with gadgets. I'm good with analytics. If, if you just leave anybody to themselves, what am I going to do? Reach out and – like there's no way. <laughs> leave me to myself without the, the team. And, like, you know what I mean? They're the work. So yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, but have. do you choose them, or do they? Uh, of course, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so you made a you've you made a positive decision to, where I'm no good at something, or if I can't do something, I make you've made positive decision to go and find people who are good at those particular tasks. For yeah. sure, getting anywhere is people are connected and they're friends with people. It's that's like getting any, unless you have a an enormous amount of money already that you can just buy your way into everything. Um, but obviously, that's not the truth. Um, for me, I mean, uh, and so yeah, like you need to know people that have those connections and stuff. Of course, yeah. And what do you do now when mates of yours from the past see you're successful and they uh, think you brushed them or you you bridging up or uh, or or do you get or do you still go and see them? You have no, lunch with them. What do, what do you Biggest do? What do you do? Biggest lesson of my life: ninety seven percent of people that I grew up with are hateful, spiteful people that sit around and little little friendship circles and run me down and just me memorize every little mistake I had in my life. And they're very upset that they're in the same place doing the same thing and I'm not and they take it as some type of attack. I don't know why, uh, but it's a big lesson. But I do have a few friends, look, maybe out of like 100 people I grew up with, uh, like I said, there's probably about four of them and like they genuinely are happy for me. And what do you do with it? Because do you, do you, do you, oh, you, so you make an effort to hang out with them every now and uh, then? Look, like, I could make a better effort. But, yeah, they're the four people that I casually see and yeah, do yeah. have love for. But, yeah, there's like entire suburbs that I thought that, you know, I grew up with and, I, yeah, it's just like they just – but that's what sadness does to people. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I guess one of the things is I'm, I sort of remember – some of my mates, if they'd never, if they were crooks, they never used to want anyone to know they're going any good. Because the last thing you want anyone to know is going good, because someone will come bite you. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they always say, "Mate, can you help me out with a bit of help me out with a loan, or oh, you know, would you invest in this? I've got a invest I've got, in this business because I think it's a really great idea. How do you go with that sort uh, of shit? Look, they wouldn't ask me for that much, but even just casual couple hundred here, couple hundred there. I now have a Facebook Messenger of like thirty five unopened messages. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> too busy. Yeah, like there's a one of my mates I was close to. He's like, you know, a couple hundred. Yeah, sweet. Couple hundred. Yeah, sweet. And then he's just, bro, do you even talk to me? Is there even in between? At least fake the in between <laughs> conversation. Like he didn't. It was just like three hit ups for loans, and I just I haven't opened this message for a year now. Because sometimes you've got to be careful what you wish for. Like you want to become really well known and admired for, you know, I don't mean that in an egotistical way, just yeah. admired by an audience. 
But the flip side of that is that um, you're going to get as you probably get as many or maybe even more people who dislike you. Yeah. And uh, and then you're going to get a lot of people going to try and take advantage of you. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Like, I've, I, I have, have you come up across that yet? Uh, the take advantage, not at all. Um, other than like people hitting up for loans, I wouldn't call that take advantage. Um, the 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 dislike stuff. Uh, yeah, of course, of course. Um, it's only as powerful as you let it be. You know what I mean? We're not in some crazy third world country where people are out here murdering everyone. This and that's Australia. Like, what's what's going to happen with it? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's, yeah. Oh, so you dislike me? Okay, or well, they like. You know what I mean? I don't walk the streets thinking that some terror. You know what I mean? Something terrible is going to happen. Not at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've got no beef with anyone. There's no real heartfelt grudges out there. It's just a general um, jealousy. So there's no issues. Yeah. What do you got tatted across your forehead? Court and hustle. Yeah. Court yeah, and hustle. I was trying to read the, the last word. Yeah. Why did you put that up there? What's that about? Two things. Court and a hustle. What it actually means. My life, I feel like, was caught in a hustle. The way I grew up, you know what I mean? Hustling in the streets and the mentality stays with me forever until today. Our society is generally caught in a hustle. Uh, but also, it's my favorite song. It's my favorite rap song from a rapper called Immortal Technique. He made a song called Caught in a Hustle and I just always loved that song. And in the little spurts that I was out during my life, I jump straight on the computer and play it. And it's like, wow, well, I've been waiting three years to hear this song. And then I'd get locked up and I'd know the lyrics and sometimes I'd rap it to myself in my head. And I just love that song, yeah. When you're locked up and you're looking forward to be able to hear Court and Hustle when you got out, mm. but during those periods... Is what, it my water? Yes, yours, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. What, do you, what do you do to uh, while the time away? When, what were you doing in prison to sort of make it easier for yourself? Oh, not a lot, man. Like I was in because of my escape classification. Uh, just made me... What's that mean? So that, mean, so that means you're an escape threat. Me, in my opinion, it's unjustified. I was 16 years old down the street here at King's Cross McDonald's and I had warrants out and a police officer grabbed me, placed me in custody, yes, not handcuffed, and um, told me I got warrants out. He loosened his grip and I ran away. A 16-year-old ran away from police. Whoa, that's never happened before. Well, anyway, two years later, I went to jail from boys' homes and I had the escape police custody charge on my criminal record from 2002. So then they said, oh, you're an escape threat. So then they treated that running from police that one day in McDonald's as to me needing to be treated as an, a high-risk inmate in prison for the rest of my life, which excludes me from any rehabilitation program, any young offenders program, any type of work or – reintegration into because society. Because those things happen outside. Those things happen as yeah. a minimum security inmate yeah, yeah. in minimum security places. So I got none of that because of that day. It was a very life-changing day and it shaped my life. So then, yeah, I was spent the, the rest of my adult jail career, if you call it that, as, a, as an E-class O. Uh, so because of that, to get back to your question, I just sat in concrete yards with nothing to do but play cards and do dips and chin-ups. Yeah. That's it. And line up for the phone. <laughs> That's it. Why, why, who would you ring? Um, occasionally my mum. Uh, most, And then the last time I was in jail, I was in a relationship. And so my partner at the time. When you say you're just sit, sort of sitting there in the yard, we know that, well, not everyone knows, but like you know, the, everyone's got groups. You're all hanging out in a group. You're not sitting there by yourself. And as you said, you, you hang with your mates, probably the kids growing up in Dully Chill or Redfin or yeah, wherever yeah, it is, yeah. and, but the Indigenous, some of the Indigenous with Koori boys, yeah. they're, whilst you're in their company, it's okay. But if there's a conflict, mm. it's a major problem. Yeah. Yeah, did, yeah. Did you see much conflict? Yeah, of course. So that, that's mainly exists in my earlier jail time, the early 2000s till about 2010. Um, and, yeah, there's racial conflicts and you would always have to be sitting with the race of people that you're with. And there's many fights that happened in the yards in front of me. Um, luckily enough, I was never part of one because I, I was at that time I was with the Kuris, like I said, and I had just by chance never been in a yard where the Kuris were fighting someone else. But I've seen many fights. Um, biggest fight that I've seen was the Lebos fight the Islanders if you can call it that, it was really just like a hundred Lebos demolishing eight Islander lads because the numbers just numbers were 
the amount of Lebanese people in jail compared to Islanders is just huge. It's like triple the amount. So, uh, but that was a crazy fight. And we were just sitting there like just watching and they're just like everyone was just punching on. It's like, what? <laughs> the uh, prison officers, what are they, what are they doing? What are they doing when this is going on? Uh, a couple of them are copping uppercuts to the head. A couple <laughs> of them are running, waiting for the super screws to come. yeah. yeah. And um and hiding, yeah. And that's all they do. They don't get involved until the super screws come. And even then they don't get involved in such numbers. So there's the super screws they call the squad. They're usually big steroid munchers and they do fight training and like it, it you wouldn't mess with them one on one. Like, you know, there's four of them, they're monsters, they'll smash you. But they're not gonna go in four on four. Nah. They they always have to have the advantage. They're yeah. smart. It's work to them. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. not there to prove they're tough or there's yeah. some act like it. But when it comes down to the crunch, they're like, bro, I'm not getting hurt for this. Like, no, totally. Yeah, so. And they it, know. They also know that someone could pull a knife or a shiver on them. And for sure. Anything for can happen. For sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so they wait and then the super, super screws come with the guns and um, gas canisters and that's a whole other level up. And uh, when they come, they gas everyone. Everyone gets screamed at. Guns get shot into the floor as warnings. Then everyone's on the floor and then they'll come in. Yeah, was, yeah. Then they'll be tough and then they'll kick you in the face while you're on the floor. <laughs> so, so, you got, so in other words, you've got plenty of time to watch this, uh, this, this blue between the, the two gangs. Yeah, well, it's unfortunate if you're a victim of that. Like if I was one of those Islander lads getting kicked, each one by 20 lebos, I would have been spewing because like, if they want to kill you, they can kill you. It takes so long. It takes like almost three minutes for people to come. Like you'll die in 30 seconds. Yeah. So if, if yeah, then they really can't help you. But lucky there was not enough passion in that fight that anyone was trying to kill anyone. No one got stabbed in that. It was just like a statement. But it was still like cool to watch. It was just so many people punching on everywhere. That yeah. was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, I mean, it sounds stupid. We all love a brawl. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Moment, long we're not like you know, it. when you watch the footy, yeah, State yeah, Origin, yeah. and yeah. they all rumble. Totally. It's like that, but on steroids, just yeah. everywhere, and like there's alarms going off, and it was crazy. Yeah, like like all the sensations in the world: noise, you know, violence, you know, yeah, yeah. movement, a gun, scr- yeah, like yeah. point of screw screaming, and and lucky, like at that time, there was only maybe twelve of us curries there over in the corner. So like we're just thinking, fuck, lucky it's not us. You know what I mean? Because that was a very, at that time, very Lebo dominated jail. So we're just glad it was them, not us. And, <laughs> and, and, and did they do it um, because they're, they're trying to establish a power base? I mean, is it about power base or is it over Is it over a business transaction? What, what, are, what are the, I don't know, that one, specifically, but, well, yeah, take no, that one. It's specific. Example. It's yeah. 20 years ago, yeah. jail fights. Like yeah, it's yeah. nothing. Um, that one was because an Islander lad had punched an old Lebo man in the face in another yard. So a big, strong up. Islander lad who was, yeah, punched a Lebo in the face in 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 another yard. So the Lebos in this yard were just like, yeah, all right. You want to punch an old man? Let's go. Yeah. Just That's how it usually goes, yeah, yeah. like that, yeah. It's, it's not because of like, you know, there's some sort of transaction outside the outside the, the walls. It oh, can be. Yeah. Yeah, it's just never really that strategic as like it's like power moves and that. It's rarely that. Yeah. It's rarely just over a word. Oh, it's mostly just over a word or the phone, an argument over the phone, or For little flare-ups. Yeah, little flare-ups. Yeah. And and in in jail, how bad are the drugs? Ah, uh, so back then it was starting to become bad. The last time I was in jail, uh, throughout the 2010s, about 2017, um, it was very bad. It was very bad. Nobody's really that that like fit in jail anymore. Nobody's. Drugs are really bad, yeah. It's mainly bup, buprenorphine, the the uh, replacement drug for heroin addiction that's given by nurses. It's mainly the uh, that getting sold and smoked and shot up by inmates. It's that. It's that's all like eighty percent of jail is now. And is that like that's a drug they take just to sort of zone out, like to to fuck them up. It's yeah, yeah. Oh, what the people who aren't actually on it, the, no, people, the people who, yeah, are, who are taking it, who are the, taking it. Oh, yeah, it's, it feels like heroin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it like, just puts them out. Yeah, like, yeah. The, the, just the, puts forget. Them out. Don't it just makes them happy, gives them yeah. energy, and makes them forget about where they are. So is uh, meth a big deal in jail? Uh, as in ice? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, rarely, rarely. Rarely. Yeah. Um, gee, you'd have to be a really big ice addict 
um, and a lover of ice to want to be sitting in a jail cell for 21 hours icing. <laughs> I think even the biggest ice heads in the world would choose heroin in that situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, it, look, people sneak it in. And obviously a drug that gets snuck in is going to be much, much rarer than a drug that he's got from the clinic. Um, but, yeah, of course people use, but rarely. And, and the, the currency inside, what is it? So it's either going to – it's in small transactions. It's going to be things like uh, ch- uh, tuna cans and, and buy-up, just buy-up in general. You yeah. owe me $20. Yeah. So when your buy-up slip comes for the week, I'll tell you what to put. 20. That's for smaller side stuff and larger side stuff, as everyone knows, it's no secret. It's just people transacting outside from account to account. Yeah, 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 yeah. But inside the currency is uh, food, goods. Yeah, food, goods. food. Big, on your is that because the food's so shit? But what I mean, cans of tuna. Uh, like the the food, even on the buy up, is so shit. To be honest, uh, up until two thousand and eight, there used to be fresh food on the buy ups, and so you could get anything from bread to meats, mince, chicken wings, sujuk, fresh eggs, fresh vegetables on the buy up. And cook them in your cell, make your own food. Then it turned to non perishable packet food and cans only from 2008. Well, why did they change that? What? Um, it'd be a mixture between people complaining that they're eating well, right? Because I've seen a lot of write ups and a lot of like new uh, current affair that things. Prisoners like, are eating well. Yeah. What's fucking wrong with that? Oh, uh, like just everything, apparently. But, um, you know, just people just complain about everything. So it'd be a mixture of that. And I think that. They'd be taking a bit of losses on perishable food. Not too much. They'd always be making a profit. But, you know, like you're shipping around perishable food and it doesn't get there and it goes off. So just to make it easier, streamline and keep everyone happy, you're eating packet food from now on. And then the food just went horrible. It was noodles and tuna and cans of baked beans and chicken in a can and microwave rice. That's the entirety of your food. Where are the places you spent time? So where did you go? MRC. Parkley, Windsor, Long Bay, Parramatta, um, Bathurst, Lithgow, Kempsey, Wellington, Juney. So you did make it to Grafton? No, I didn't go to Grafton. Did you say Grafton? Yeah. No, nah, I haven't been to Grafton. A um, lot of j- – there's so many jails now. So many. There's like 38 now. When I was around, there was like 27. Yeah, I only ever been to they, – see, they have this thing, once you go to a jail and you don't misbehave there – that's your natural choice of jail. Um, yeah. So like say the first time I got sent to Bathurst because I nothing bad happened there and I got released without any hitches, you will always go there. It's just that's comfortable for them to send there. Yeah. And where, where did you prefer? What was what, – Junet, out of all those jails? Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, there's pros to being in Sydney. You're close for family visits. But at the end of the day, you're going to get shipped out during a sentence. You're not going to do your sentence in Sydney. Uh, Junet was the best. Junet by far. He's reminding me of a story. I remember, I remember when I was a kid, when I was, when I was a kid, I was in my early 20s um, and I was working for his firm and uh, they had a, a client, down, an abattoir was a client down in Juneau. Yeah. And uh, they told me to, and, uh, you know, I love mistake and everything like that. And yeah. They sent me down to Juneau to do some work in this abattoir. I learned not work in the abattoir. They were a client of ours. Went down there and, uh, fuck, like I, I went, they, as soon as I came in as a city boy, they yep. fucking saw what was going on and they took me into their uh the, you know, watch the animals getting killed and like skinned, and it was pretty horrific. You know, yeah. shooting some sort of bolt through the cow's head, and all the animals know that they're all going to get killed. They're all lined up in the yard, and um, and uh, they took me into the and uh, the blokes who were the actual blokes doing the butchering. Um, at the end of the day, they took me into their dressing room, and each one of them had guns in their dressing room. And they all went out hunting straight after that, and were shooting stuff and killing more animals. And they said to me that night, "Do you want to come and have dinner down the pub?" And I went down the pub with all these blokes because I had to stay the night. It was only like 21 or something. Yeah, yeah. Went down the pub the night. I'll never forget it. They, they couldn't wait to um, see what I was going to eat. And I fucking couldn't eat steak. I I, I just kept thinking of all these fucking animals oh, just no being way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. murdered and butchered. Seeing it, yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, and that's the only time I've been in Juneau. I have yeah. this horrific memory of it. Yeah. I, just, I eat meat, by the way, but uh, but uh, but I just I'll never forget that that these guys all day are killing animals. Yeah. And then in the afternoon, when the day finished, they went out shooting more animals. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and Juneau it's was their entire like, existence. Oh mate, it was just really murder. Yeah, it was <laughs> killing me. Like, what the fuck? I just what the hell? And uh, uh there's and you. Th- because you think country people are the opposite to yeah. the city people. Like I grew up in, in the west suburbs yeah. and 
I thought, well, I'm going to go out to Journey where everyone's a country bumpkin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it ain't like that. Yeah. They're more hectic than the yeah, people yeah. I was hanging out with yeah, in the city. Yeah, like, in, a no, lot of, in, in, in a lot of ways, yeah. Fuck yeah. Like yeah. Not, no one I knew would be able to get a pig and gut it and, no. and uh, <laughs> you know, drop it in a boiling water and st- steam off the fucking hair and shit yeah. like that then go and shoot a few rabbits or whatever else they yeah, shooting after like, it. Yeah. It's pretty hectic. So so Journey was your favourite yeah. joint. It's funny you say the abattoir too because that the, the minimum security – Inmates at Junee actually work in that abattoir. That's probably why. They're probably yeah. the dudes I was yeah. seeing. <laughs> yeah, probably. That's that was actually one of their highest paying jobs. Um, but yeah, Junee, um, that was it was it's a private jail. It was the only at the time the only privatized jail, and um, that just meant like compared to correctly service New South Wales, mate, they just treated you like they treated you like they cared about you almost. It was, it was good. <laughs> yeah, so does that mean they don't have um, uh, normal corrective services um, like uh, screws, like or they have their own? Different screws, um, own. different uniforms. They dress like pilots, black pants, white shirts. Oh, really? Yeah, they had um, nothing to do with corrective service buy-up. They had their entire different buy-up. You could buy stuff from Rebel Sports on the outside, like uh, their own food they had cooked there. So it was all fresh food. It was all one-out cells. So your cells, everyone had their own cell. They let you out all day like six in the morning to six at night. Uh, they never kicked you out in the yard. Like, yeah, there was just like- So really it was minimum security? No, no, this is, uh, this is a, I was an escapee. I was an yeah. E2, yeah. which was medium security. Wow. So yeah, so the E's, you can be E1 or E2. So when you're unsentenced on remand, you'll be E1 maximum. And E2, when you're sentenced, they'll let you go to medium, which is essentially maximum. They just like let you stay in your wing longer. That mean there's less fences. Doesn't mean there's more programs. It's the same. You just you just treat it slightly better. What about what would Debatably. you say to the young? Because you know what, you're an influencer now. I mean, yeah. you've got a lot of influence. A lot of young people will, will listen to what you got to say, and a lot of them will listen to your rap music and um and they just look at you, listen to you, and they'll sort of admire you. Okay, mm-hmm. what do you say to them today about life crime? What's your, what's your story? What's your message? You, have you got one or you don't give a fuck? No, no, I do have a message. I've, I've, you know, I have said it numerous times and um, about a life of crime. I always say that if you're going to ask me, is a life of crime worth it? It's definitely not. It's much better things you can do and much other people that I used to look at as gronks because they were from areas I was from and they didn't do crime have led much better lives than me. I'm making up for it but I'm the lucky one. Um, so it's definitely a shit life. But I'm not going to tell you ever don't be a criminal because I'm not a policeman and I'm not your dad and I don't really care what you do. I'll just tell you the truth. It's like it's a shit life and I'll just say that for people who are adamant they're going to be criminals, uh, like at least, at least make it, make your life better. Like you want to take the risk and be a criminal. There's a lot of risk. You know what I mean? Uh, money for your freedom. Some people in there for 15, 12 years, 27 years. I've got my mates in there for 33 years. At least make it make your life better. Don't be one of those idiots that just wants to like hurt people. You know what I mean? Like at least if you can sit there and say, yeah, I've done eight years jail, but like I somehow have a positive experience from it. All right. That's what I say. Don't fight over rubbish. I'm from this suburb. I'm from that suburb. I'm tougher than you. Like there's no dumber criminal than someone that just bashes people and goes to jail for it, hurts people, stabs people, shoots people. Yeah, no, that's that's all I say. And I take that stance. I stay in the middle. You know what I mean? I'm not going to come out here like every other person that comes out of jail and tell you like, don't, like you know, don't be a criminal. This and they do what you want. I don't really care about you, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's my honest, yeah, that that's makes, my honest and opinion. And that makes sense yeah. too. As I said, you don't give a yeah, shit. Like, I've just got lessons to give you and they're the true lessons and I say it from my heart. If I could have my time back, I would not be a criminal. If I must be a criminal for whatever theoretical reason, I would be a solely successful based criminal that was very smart. I definitely would take out like the stabbings and the, I'm the tough guy. These Take that shit out of it. That's rubbish. No yeah. bigger gronk just, than you someone. Just make money. Yeah, imagine some idiot. Like it's stupid. I've been in jail for many stabbings and I feel like an idiot. Imagine some idiot sitting in jail for 10 years. What would you do? Oh, I was tougher than someone one night. <laughs> you idiots. Yeah, yeah. You idiot. Your whole family's out there. No one's looking after them. No one's protecting your little sister. No one's protecting your kids. Your missus is gone. What a loser what because you were tougher than someone one night. 
You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Where's your cars? Where's your jewelry? At least you got cool stories to tell. At least those people got stories to tell. That's it. That's all I can say. And and someone like you is, and I, I see who you follow because I follow you, and mm. we we follow lots of similar people. But who who right now? I mean, I'd like to ask this question of you. Um, who who do you follow in sports? What sports do you follow? I wish I was more of a sports person. I wish I was, bro. Like the only sp- the sports that I love are kickboxing. UFC, MMA. Which UFC person do you follow now? And see, I wish that I was more – the last two years of my life, I follow Bam Bam. Yeah, but Bam Because Bam. he's from Sydney. Yeah. Right? And I follow Volkanovski because he's Aussie. And so, I, you know what I mean? But um, my fa- favourite MMA, MMA fighters don't fight anymore. I'm a bit like one of those older school people, you know? And like, so if you ask me what MMA fighters do you love, I'm rattling off people from 2002. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you, but you like Bam Bam. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course. How can you not love a UFC heavyweight that's smashing everyone that's from down the street? Of course. But how fucking cool is he? Yeah. yeah like, and he and he, he's hectic and he's got his own beer and he's got he's got all yeah, this shit going mad. on. Like he's he's he's, he's really embracing uh, uh whether he figured it out for himself or he he's someone like gave him the inside knowledge, he's really embracing that side of it, the character side of it, speak out, be yourself, have a laugh. Yeah, yeah. And it's that part of the success is he would know himself as good or greater than the actual physical sport that he's playing. It's very powerful. And, he, and he's he's very influential too because yeah. he's also part Aboriginal. So he's yep, yep. Islander Aboriginal. Island, he's yeah, got yeah. both, a bit of each. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, the way he wears the Aboriginal flag, I mean, like he's – Really established himself as a as an identity, yeah. Similar to you to some extent, mm-hmm. you know, because very I'd, similar. I'd and say you got similar sort of audience, yeah, similar of people. Course. Probably eighty percent. Well, he'll have like a whole the audience that I, yeah, the USC. He'd have yeah, all yeah. these international followers that like just would have no yeah. idea who I am. Yeah, That's yeah. a whole. When you're you know an international sportsman, you can't compete with that. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of Australian based um, fans, sure. it'd be eighty percent similar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then totally. like. Doing what he does is so good because, like, he didn't have to, he, he he could lose his next fight and his next fight and his next fight and he's still gonna be someone. Yeah, yeah. And he's still gonna have a mad hustle he's got because, a mad person, because of what he's doing now. That's it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then if you could meet anyone in the world, who would you like to meet? Crazy Bone. Yeah. Yeah, my favorite rapper of all time. I don't really. I'm not a really person that idolizes people, and I don't get excited by meeting anyone. And people ask, "Oh, who's your dream podcast guest?" And I'm like, "Man." Have a dream guest. I don't, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's how I look at it. Yeah. But I, you know, like I say crazy bone, like, yeah. Ever since I was a kid, um, every stolen car I was in, chuck his music on. His music, the, his raps, his songs takes me back to places in my life. And uh, yeah, crazy bone. He's one of the Bone Thugs members. If you remember the rap group Bone Thugs and Harmony. You probably don't, but no. uh, the very but famous. But I'm not anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very famous rap group. Uh, been around for a long time. He's their lead member. Yeah, him. And I want to ask you one more question. Spanian, why, 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 where did the nickname come from? The nickname came because going back to before, um, dominated Aboriginal area. So that means if you're, if you have a background that is not a, majority minority, Tongan, Lebanese, Vietnamese, Aboriginal, if you're one of the in-between and you're not fully Aussie, you just get called, you probably have had people like this before, right? And you just get called where you're from. Like, for example, I have a Jamaican mate. He's just, hey, Jamaica, you're Jamaica. And I'm, I'm, my best mate's Colombian. His name's Colombia. Everyone just go, Colombia. So it's like people, although I'm all these backgrounds, right, I feel like I look mostly Spanish. I have the height of a Dutch person. I have the appearance of a Spanish person. But I say Spanish because look how I look. I couldn't be bothered having a comp. What nation are you? I'm Irish. And I'd be like, <laughs> fuck off. And I go, all right. So I say Spanish and it shuts people up the quickest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then they say Spanish and they just go, oh, yeah, you look Spanish, but you're a bit tall and that's good enough. So people ask me, I say Spanish and they go, Spaniard. That's it. And it's stuck. And it's stuck. Well, it, originally it was Spaniard with a D, the proper way. And it was like that for a couple of years, but like everybody was Spaniard. 
You know what I mean? You watch Rafael Nadal, the Spaniard. The Spaniard, no, I want to be my own person. So I changed the D to an N. So you changed that? I changed That's it. That's cool. Yeah, and I started saying to everyone. Because I called, think it's a word, but now you're telling me it's not a no, word. It's no, a word you I made, made up. made it up. So everyone that was calling me Spaniard, I'm like, bro, it's not Spaniard. I'm from Australia. I'm from Sydney. It's Spanian. And then, then that's, yeah. That's it's funny. Cool. That you, what you say is correct because uh, in a different sort of environment, um, when I was in business with Kerry Packer, um, he used to, I'm sure he probably forgot my name a few times in the early stages, but he's called me the Greek. The Greek. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in his environment, there was no Greeks. Yeah. You know, there was a few Jewish boys, and but mostly Aussies. Yeah. I'm going back a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he say, "Hey, Greek, what do you think of that?" Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, or every time I would we talk about money, he'd say, "Ask the Greek. He doesn't spend anything." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they still had a joke about our, how, my budget. Like I used to have a budget, a personal yeah. budget, and I wouldn't spend any more than that per week. I'm still the same, by the way. And uh, he say, "Ask the Greek how much he spends every week." Go on, Greek. Um, and uh, similar. Yeah. Yeah, uh, similar. yeah. Because I was different to all them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's just different. And as long as there's not too many, then the words you, accept, yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. call someone a Tongan. Yeah, yeah. And six people will look at you. Like, Which one? <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Well, yeah, I, I really enjoy myself today. Yeah, you got yeah. you're sort of like um, I think I mean apart from being real authentic and honest, and you have got good stories, but uh, you, you're sort of lighthearted. You know, you bring a lightheartedness to the day. To the, this conversation's been light. Yeah, I don't mean without content. Yeah, I don't yeah, mean yeah. without substance. But I mean, I know exactly what you fun. mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's light, and I it's, don't get dramatic. And yeah, you're not. Yeah, it's not totally. Too many you're not trying going, to. Yeah. You're not trying to fucking victimize myself. And yeah, yeah, yeah layer no, it up no. and say this. And but that, I can't stand those conversations. There are a couple of mates like that live the same lives. No, fuck off. If you ask them what you asked me today, they'd be in this seat crying. Yeah, I was like, bro, relax, bro. Like, yeah, relax. Let's talk about it factually, have a laugh, and yeah. get on with life. And every Saturday afternoon down the pub, they're telling the same stories. Yeah, week yeah, after yeah. week after yeah. week. And just get on with it. Yeah. I really enjoyed myself. Thanks, man. My brother. Thank you.